Hello, I'm Jeff Young with the ARM HPC Users Group, and I'm happy to be here today with Roxana Rusatoro, who is going to present about deep learning with ARM SVE. Uh, Roxana is a staff engineer at ARM. Uh, she's been part of many different HPC projects, including Montfalk 1, 2, and 3. Uh, most recently, she's done research on uh, SVE optimizations, uh, application porting, and specifically for this talk, uh, doing machine learning with ARM SVE. Thanks for being with us, Roxana. Hi, Jeff. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the kind introduction. Uh, so yes, today I'll be telling you about deep learning with ARM SVE. And if my slides work. So um, I'll start with kind of the first disclaimer. I am a sort of an HTML, aka HPC person. Um, as you can tell, I'm amazing at drawing, but uh, in part, I've actually spent the better part of my last decade in ARM working on HPC within ARM research specifically. And I've worked on everything from application optimization to current development, current development to simulation infrastructure and next generation architectures. And now I do ML and I'm actually looking after kind of ML on CPUs. So how this whole thing started is uh, this year, Supercomputer Fugaku came out. It's a, an amazing machine. And obviously, you want to train large networks on this. But it's not, you know, this is a lot more than just a simple machine. And some of the workloads that, are, for example, are running today on it, I mean, I'm saying this is just a subset, um, are a lot of, obviously, coronavirus treatment uh, and simulations around, you know, wearing masks, airflow, virus transmission, et cetera. And as you've seen today, in, you know, in the news, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you, you've uh, stumbled upon this. Quite a lot of them also use machine learning. Um, you know, uh, th there was one I remember around, uh, I don't think that this was run on the Fugaku, but uh, there were some simulations being run that helped identify the, the right proteins for scientists and then narrow down from thousands to, to a small subset. Uh, so they, they can be very impactful. And kind of going and digging a little bit down into what makes the 64 fx special in a way um, is actually uh, it, well, it's a 48 core uh, processor w with four system cores, but it's got SVE. And in addition to that, it's got two pipelines, 512 bits. So it's got fairly wide SVE and it's got a wide range of precisions available uh, from, you know, all the, sorry, actually, yeah, all the way down to FP16 and int 8, which are kind of important for machine learning applications. And in addition to that, it has a tremendous amount of memory bandwidth. It's got uh, HBM2 stacks. And its peak bandwidth is a terabyte a second, which is a wonderful, uh, a wonderfully high number. So let's dig down a little bit into SVE and what it is. I'm sure many of you have seen this before, but in case you haven't, uh, this is like a you know kind of two minute introduction. So first of all, SVE is a new vector extension that came after uh, as well as SIMD, also known as ARM Neon, and it's added features needed for new markets, aka Think HPC, machine learning, and not just uh, things like gather loads and scatter stores, per lane predication, and longer vectors. There are a few key features that make SVE different. So first of all, there is no preferred vector length. The vector length is a hardware choice, uh, ranging from the standard 128-bit, like for example, like Neon, all the way to 2048-bit in increments of 128. And it now promotes a new kind of programming, which is a vector length agnostic pro uh, programming, which adjusts dynamically to the available vector length. So your assembly, the actual assembly instructions do not have the concept of vector length. They are, you know, an add is an add. It doesn't matter if it's 512 bit or 2048, the operations are agnostic. SV is not an extension of CMD, of, sorry, the advanced CMD or NEON. Uh, it is a separate, optional extension that comes with this new set of instruction encodings. And whilst the, again, the initial focus was HPC and general purpose server, uh, and actually not media and image processing, kind of DSP style instructions in NEON are in NEON. Uh, in addition to that, SV kind of begins to tackle some traditional barriers to auto vectorization. So first of all, we've got very low overhead versus scalar code to kind of to encourage the opportunistic vectorization. Um, and there are other things like, um, you know, the software-bounded speculative vectorization, 
uh, of uncounted loops. So we can actually now uh, ma kind of manage to vectorize across, for example, while loops. And we can extract obviously more data level parallelism from existing source code as a result of this. So why vector length agnostic? Uh, there are a couple of advantages and disadvantages to, you know, to, to the approach. The, the main kind of pros um, are you can fit into the 32-bit fixed with uh, A64 instruction set encoding all of the instructions. Um, you do not need to add more instructions every single time you increase the vector length. And especially across an ecosystem where every partner can choose to implement, for example, if they have an architecture license, a you know, a, a, an implementation uh, suitable for, you know, say somebody may choose, may, may say that the, uh, the further workloads, 1024 is a perfect number. Some of them may say, actually, you know what, 128 bit is a, is, is a wonderful size choice. You wouldn't want to have separate instructions and have to report the code across the different, you know, when I say report, I mean, you know, you recompile fully to get different instructions to do this. It, it's, it's a very cumbersome task. So this way with a single, uh, kind of agnostic uh, instruction set, you can much more seamlessly uh, apply, uh, you know, the, all the existing binaries between implementations. So, I mean, hardware implementations. Uh, it's also future, future proof set, of course, because again, you don't need the instruction set. Um, and um, sorry, when the vector length increases. And also, again, the code automatically scales to the whole vector length. Um, you don't need to recompile. No need to rewrite hand coded SD assembler intrinsics, none of that. Um, it kind of just works. Um, I will now, obviously, just because this is where kind of the challenges kind of start as well. So, just because the code will work, it does not mean necessarily will run as optimally because, uh, to, to remember, SV is an architectural extension, it's not a micro architectural implementation. So obviously there are differences between the various implementations. So you're not always guaranteed that just because a code ran very say, optimally on one platform, it will just automatically run optimally on a different platform simply because it just uses SV. There are other you know, microarchitectural features like the memory bandwidth, for example, or not even, sorry, that's, that's a system architecture feature, but there are other features that will ov obviously affect this as well. Um, and also, also in addition to that, programmers and compilers do have to think differently about factorization. A, a, lot, of, a lot of codes out there are, are very, kind of have very baked in, um, you know, notions about you've got to have the, the 512 or, or there's kind of the fixed size mentality. So, so this is, this is, a, this is a growing opportunity. Um, and obviously different vector lengths can actually expose latent bugs. Um, you know, stack layout changes may expose, may, sorry, may expose stack overflowing bugs. Um, and, you know, it's difficult to validate, obviously, at the, all the, of the 16 vector lengths. Obviously, that there are a few kind of really common ones, like, you know, say 1 to 8, 2, 5, 6, 5, 12, maybe even 1,024. Um, but um, I, we understand, you know, obviously, this is a bit different. So there, there needs to be more thought going into uh, the kind of the software development process here. But let me tell you about some of the other features of SVE. So I already mentioned it's got getter loads and it's got a source. Uh, which is kind of a fairly self-explanatory uh, feature. Per lane predication, so you can actually operate on the individual lanes uh, of the vector, and you've got the predicate register that controls uh, that controls the operations. And also, we have predicate-driven loop control and management, so you can actually eliminate your traditional kind of you know loop head or tail and other overheads that kind of you have to use normally when you process partial vectors. In this case, you just set a predicate, and that's it. Uh, and also the things like vector partitioning for software managed manipulation. So we now have a first fold vector load instructions that, that can actually allow to do vector accesses to cross into invalid pages. But as soon as it folds, obviously it masks the predicate register. So you don't actually perform any you know, bad uh, loads that you shouldn't have access to. And obviously there's also, we also extend kind of floating point and bitwise horizontal reductions uh, for in order or tree based floating point sums. Uh, and we're training off repeatability versus performance. So let's kind of go back to the software. Um, I've spoken kind of a bit about SVE and the value it adds and some of its features, but looking at the software and the training stack, because we want to talk about actually you know, doing machine learning training in this case, uh, there is actually a wide variety uh, of software and actually a wide variety of platforms. The, the ML software stack is kind of and kind of or AR64 and, and kind of and or SVE. Um, 
to be very clear, not all of these tools available here will work on SV out of the box. So the, everything is being ported at the moment, uh, as far as I can tell. Um, but not necessarily all of them will be in kind of perfect shape, you know, most optimized code ever, because as we, we just got, as, you know, uh, SV platform this year. So, um, you know, there's obviously still more development to be done, uh, but a lot has already been just tremendous amount of uh, uh, tooling and, and libraries out there already. Also, likewise, not all the platforms that are listed um, in kind of the hardware list have SV or have all the architectural features listed here. This is just a an over kind of an overall um, wider view of the available architectural features for ML training uh, or ML in general. Uh, some of the uh, AR64 kind of uh, platforms and some of things. So I'll go briefly through them. Uh, so for ML frameworks, uh, popular ones such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, Cafe, we already have um, container images, uh, you know, like Docker container images and build recipes to kind of help developers get along if, uh, you know, get started sooner or users, not just developers. And already popular ML frameworks support ARM as a first class citizen. In addition to that, we have ML libraries such as OneDNN, Eigen, ARMPL, and ARMCL uh, available uh, as well. And this is not just us. There, uh, there's you know um, a tremendous amount of effort uh, and development that's also gone throughout the entire ARM ecosystem. This is not just ARM you know contributing some of these. Uh, for example, uh, Recon or Fujitsu have also posted um, lots of developments online, uh, also on GitHub open source. So so please do check out uh, some of the work as well. And we already have the, you know, the debuggers you're very used to. Uh, ARM Forge, you know, DDT and MAP and profilers uh, are obviously available and working. We also have a selection of training benchmarks. Uh, I mean, I put kind of the most popular one uh, being MLProf training. There's also obviously MLProf HPC. You know what you, you kind of your preferences are. So, you know, the, 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 that's kind of up to the user. Uh, and in terms of architectural features, we've got dot product support, we've got SV and actually there's SV2 as well. Even though to be clear, none of the none of the implementations uh, listed support SV2 at the moment. I mean, we just just got SV. Um, there will be quite a number of years probably before we'll see the first SV2 one. Uh, and we also have things like Int8, BFlow16, FP16, FP32, which are data types pretty much necessary for for machine learning. And we also have added a matrix multiplication extension as well. And we've got a very wide range of hardware. Uh, we've got the ARM Neoverse platforms, the N1, the V1, Ampere Ultra, Fujitsu A64FX, and many more uh, platforms as well. So why actually look at on CPU ML? Because we started, you know, we started kind of. I've been talking about you know SVE and, and some of the software ecosystem available and some of the other architectural features, but why actually look at um, CPU on CPU ML? So. For starters, it is you, you have a great range of flexibility. It can, you know, especially if you have already, uh, you know, for example, CPU code, it's just, it's very easy to integrate and you can run a wide variety of, of, of models and um, of algorithms far, far, very, very easily. Uh, in addition to this, it's very easy to program. Um, it's kind of safe to say that a lot of the people out there have a tremendous amount of experience programming on CPUs um, and integrating already with existing code. But also, um, we already have added ML processing kind of uh, uh, kind of specific features towards this as well, uh, and a kind of a short list on the right. Uh, so we've got obviously again the short version is architecture and microarchitecture features. The dot product instructions, the matrix multiplication ones, uh, uh, SV vector length. Oh, so the SV vector length is a microarchitecture feature, and and again architecture VFlow 16. And in brackets you have the architectural version, the minor architectural version where the feature was introduced. Uh, so yes. And in terms of frameworks, I mean this is just, I, I'm sure this is not actually a fully complete list, um, but. ARM is already very heavily involved, for example, with TensorFlow um, and, and DBench, and uh, we've got, you know, some of some of the other frameworks like Torch and Cafe are community maintained, but it's also going to speak to the ARM ecosystem and the breadth of work that's there to do and the active involvement of everybody into this. And to kind of ease some searching, I've put some Docker builds for popular ML frameworks. I put the links to them here. 
and some details a community blog post as well in case you know you, you want to check these out and overall ml training on arm based systems in a way you know it's Supercomputer for Gaku and RMSV are just the beginning, if you think about, you know, doing training on, on a machine like this and using SV. They are just one implementation and one kind of design point. There is, we already have a versatile architecture that's enriched with ML features. Uh, and we have a diverse selection of ARM-based implementations, as you've seen. Um, and there's already also obviously or, or always there a freedom to design fit-for-purpose hardware, if that's something that, you know, you're interested in. And we have a vast software ecosystem that can, you know, that can support this as well, and a very, you know, large partner base, um, all, all working towards a, a common goal. And I've just kind of put here also a few, um, just a few resources. Um, but if, I'm good by the way, just going to shout out to to John Lundford's hackathon uh, coming up soon, uh, and also. Porting and a few guys supporting optimizing HPC applications from SV and an SVNE on a com, um, code, uh, coding compared uh, guide as well. Uh, um, yeah, to be clear, I mean, this is just the beginning. Um, and also, in case you're wondering, uh, we can also do a lot of inference. There are accelerators for inference as well. Uh, and, and there's a whole software stack for that as well. Uh, so this is not just, uh, I just kind of focus on training in this talk. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Roxana. That was a great talk. It's very exciting to see all these, uh, you know, new developments, especially in the, the software space. And I'm, I'm sure we'll see some uh, some more interesting hardware implementations that go along with that. Uh, for all our viewers, thank you for watching. I want to point out that we have panels at November 9th, uh, which will be recorded. Uh, they'll be on a, a Zoom link. Uh, it's not on the, the slides here, obviously, because this is it's run you know, in part by a hug, but if you go to our website, a-hug.org, uh, there's an Eventbrite link there that you can sign up for. And Roxana will actually be part of the on-site experiences panel, which will be held at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So thank you, Roxana. I will look forward to talking with you more then. Thank you, Jeff.